Good. This is the lecture for European history for Thursday, the 16th of September, A.D. 2021. As I was saying, if you know me, you know that I am not credulous to the proposition that man-made climate change will destroy us and that we must act like panicked people desperately trying to control every bit of human activity. I, I don't believe anything that is going to be solved by global regulatory uh, regimes. I do not believe in a world government that will restrict my carbon use as the solution to a problem that's a bogus proposition in the first place. The Earth froze twice. Its atmosphere froze solid. In the Devonian period, the oxygen content of the atmosphere was so great that a mere lightning strike could cause a fireball with the effect of an artillery explosion. They had dragonflies wider, with wingspans wider than my outstretched arms. I think that's about where I was. In uh, historical time, the Visigoths and uh, Austria, I think it's just the Visigoths, crossed the frozen Rhine River in the year Anno Domini 405. In modern times, even in the coldest winters, the Rhine River doesn't freeze solid enough for a cavalry army to cross it. A thousand years ago, wine grapes grew in Scotland and in Newfoundland, Canada. They don't grow there now. So the global climate was cooler in the later part of the Roman Empire, which actually is borne out by the lower crop yields that they had. The climate was warmer, noticeably warmer, than it is today, a thousand years ago, which is one of the things that allows Eric the Red and Leif Erikson to colonize Greenland, um, yeah, to colonize Greenland and the Vinland colony on Newfoundland, North America. The Earth's climate changes naturally. And to try to freeze the climate in any kind of stasis is folly, hubris, and madness. And yet so many people, oh, sea levels will rise, then we'll move. Our cities, oh, the, the crop belts will change. We have the ability to grow crops in space if we want to, or on the surface of the moon. We can certainly solve the problem of moving our farmlands. Oh, the current political order will change. It always does! Oh, I'm, probably be, I'm probably being way too self-indulgent today. Neither a vaccine nor a mask can protect you from mortality. You will die at some point, so will everyone you know, so will I, it's part of life. Accept it, and then try to enjoy yourself, because it really doesn't matter. It's normal. It's part of our lives. You can try your damnedest to be a long-lived person, and all you may do is have a very long, very dull life. As to the climate, it will do what it will do. If we're lucky, we'll avoid an asteroid strike or a global thermonuclear war or a genuine super germ or one of the countless other things that could fundamentally change the basis of human civilization. But stopping me from eating cheeseburgers or driving an automobile is not going to save the planet. Forcing me to recycle my trash is not going to save the planet, in my humble judgment. You may believe I'm wrong. I know that there is an entire scientific establishment out there dedicated <clears throat> to asserting the notion <laughs> that man-made climate change is something called settled science. Science is a methodology. It doesn't deal in fundamental truth. There is no such thing as settled science. There are provisional theories that are used. Nothing is settled. Nothing is beyond question. A hundred years ago, geologists believed that the Earth continents rose and fell like Atlantis. Today, we believe in plate tectonics. What will we believe a hundred years from now? Anytime somebody tries to tell me to stop thinking or talking about something because it's already been settled, <laughs> I dig my heels in and want to talk more because that person does not want to debate. It's like calling me a racist. They don't want to talk to me. 
They don't want to deal with my ideas. They don't want to have a conversation, give and take. They don't want to even consider the possibility that what I'm saying may have some validity. So demonize me, do a character assassination, call me a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, or any other of the 20,000 names in the book of cancel culture. All it is is intellectual shyness or moral cowardice. Everything, everything has to be on the table when you're discussing things like this. All theories. Now, that doesn't mean you agree with nonsense. It means that you're willing to have a conversation without trying to shut someone down by the power of authority. So, after having said all that, I'm going to begin with how climate change affected European history. One of the many times it did. Before I do that, though, since I said a mouthful of opinionated stuff, you are welcome to offer contrary points of view. Different points of view reveal how I'm a moron when it comes to science and uh, Luddite and uh, saboteur of the intellectual health of our nation. Or you can just disagree. Or agree. Or have a different opinion. Does anyone wish to engage in conversation? He's crazy. I'm not going to talk to him. Johnson. What do you think is the greatest way that, um, like, talk about climate change affects politics? Well, in the global diplomatic sphere, a series of climate change accords have been signed by various nations. And what they tend to do is restrict the industrial ability output of countries that are already developed, like Western Europe and the United States, without in any way, serious way, restricting the ability of newly developing countries like China and India from using the nastiest of fossil fuels, coal. We have, uh, when we have Democrats in office, um, all regulations, for example, about automobiles and trucks that require increasingly stringent fuel economy standards. And that changes the way vehicles are built. Instead of having pickup trucks, we'll have smart cars. Uh, instead of having station wagons, we'll have Fiats, you know, those little sub-subcompact sub cars. That'll affect your life if you get into an accident. If you get into an accident, you do not want to be in a subcompact car, period. No matter how many safety features they have, it is much better to be in a big steel box that can protect you a little bit. I know, I've been in a couple of crashes, one of which was nearly fatal. There are people who want to change our diet, not by persuading us, but by making it harder and harder to obtain meat. Because cow flatulence produces methane gas. And methane gas is identified as a uh, gas that leads to global warming. Also, it would be so much better for the world, they say, to take every acre of land that's devoted to fodder for cattle and devoted to growing grain for the third world. I most of all object to the notion that government bureaucrats will do a better job than independent farmers in deciding what to plant. I like the idea of freedom in the free market. And I don't believe that humanity is the problem. I don't believe that freedom is the problem. And regulation and government interference in private life only solves the problem of human choice by restricting it. So there's my answer. However, there are people who believe that we can steer the climate um, like we steer a great ship. And those people would argue everything that I've just said is wrong and that we owe it to our great grandchildren to alter the climate in a way that restricts global warming. That was me trying to be fair. Other thoughts? Does that answer your question, or do you have more to say? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff, especially about climate change, it's very short-sighted. Uh, it's it's a short-sighted kind of uh, false flag that's put up by people on top. I don't think they actually care about that. 
it's, you know, if you look, if you look at, you know, like, for instance, maybe 1984, you know, when O'Brien is, is telling uh, Winston what, what Paul actually is out, they, they, they don't, they don't claim to make everything equal. No. They don't. They don't even claim that to be proletarian. No, the, the, the proles live like proles, the outer party live like slaves, and the inner party live like kings. That's the way it is in every communist country. And, you know, it's, I think what climate change is, is just a, a smokescreen to, it's an excuse, is what it is, to control people. You, you, would, you know that I personally happen to agree with you. I think the same thing about many of the COVID things that are coming out of the U.S. government. By the way, I'm vaccinated. I have no problem with vaccination as long as it's a choice. I have a problem. That's, that's why with, I think we married to show up. Yeah. The president of the United States losing patience with me and therefore setting up a regulatory regime that's really unconstitutional. That I have a problem with. He's not my king. He's not my God. I could give a good God damn if he's happy with me or not. He works for me. He's a civil servant. Yeah. He may have his fingers on the nuclear codes, but he has he's a civil, civil servant. And for him to put on that attitude, I think, is stunningly, breathtakingly uh, bold. How's yeah. that bold? It's just, it doesn't, uh, it's amazing because your example of like, oh, we should get rid of these cattle fields and grow grain. Well, what fertilizes those fields? <laughs> the feces from the cows. You know, well, that's a good fertilizer. So it's just there's a lot. We'll, we'll of find stuff. others, chemical fertilizers that will be, don't even get me started. I do not want to go too far off into cloud cuckoo land. I just want it to be fair. Thank you, thank you. Does anyone wish to offer another point of view, a genuinely other point of view? Okay, Roberta, thank well, you. Well, I have a different point of view. I don't know if I want to offer it because I don't have enough like information, but I can just tell you That's good. that I don't really agree with that, which most of you probably don't like to hear, but I just feel like uh, there is gas and stuff made and thrown, and there's piles of stuff that humans made, which might have affected the world. Obviously, there was... Uh, really hot, and then there was ice age, and then there was hot again. So that is a part of Earth, which I agree partially with you that it is kind of a process, but I believe that humans have still taken Thank you for saying that. I'm not going to argue against what you just said. I actually believe that humans can affect the climate. I just don't believe that we can steer it. But to look at the island of plastic in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and say that human uh, action is purely benign, no, I agree. There are things that can be done that are wise. I just, I, I thank you for saying that. I don't need to say another thing. I, I, it really matters to me that people who disagree with my insane conservative rants are willing to tell what they think because in America, everyone, I'm going to say this in a nasty way, but understand what I mean. In America, everyone has a right to be wrong. I use that right all the time. I think it's important to hear a variety of points of view. You don't have to convince me. You're never going to, probably. I'm never going to convince you, probably, and that's fine. But the expression of ideas is important. It's good for our mental health. So thank you, and yes. Um, I just have to say that... Um, you can you can say that human made climate change isn't real, but you can't deny that, especially big corporations, um, they purposefully will like pollute the environment because the what am I trying to say? The fines for polluting the environment are smaller than what would, what it would actually cost to deal with those pollutants safely and dispose of them and get rid of them instead of just releasing them. And I think that it is very, like, it's very wrong of them to reprimand, like, especially individual people for not recycling 
not using and using plastics, which you should do, don't get me wrong, recycling is a good thing because then you don't have to use as many resources, but um, at the same time it's very hypocritical because they themselves are just like causing direct and purposeful harm to their environment and I think that's very wrong and, and um, things should be changed about that so they can't do that as easily. Okay, thank you for expressing that. Um, I actually am not a giant fan of huge corporations. I prefer corporations to socialist governments and communist governments because you can escape a corporation by not using their products. You cannot escape a government that has their hooks into it. But today's corporations are strangely ideological. So can they, can they profit by pollution when they could just as easily clean up? Some do. Uh, and you've expressed your point of view extremely well. So, thank you. Do you have more? What are you saying? Um, I think it's just like the rich privilege, you know? Like, people that have that much money, sure they can park in the park in the no parking zone. It's just a $750 rent for a night because tickets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I've got to move on. And you've already said things, so forgive me if we have time later. Okay. There the Mongols are, minding their own business, like a deer eating grass in the field. Which is from the William Tell Overture, and it's the quintessential peaceful music. And then... The climate gets colder. There is a snap which makes Central Asia much less comfortable. Now, what happens is probably a result of volcanic eruptions. It could be a result of solar flares. There are several years without a summer where winter turns to a semi-spring that lasts until the beginning of winter again. In a society, well, in all societies of that time, which were subsistence agricultural societies, losing a whole year is deadly. Famine spread. Governments fell or were shaken. People thought that doom had come. And a lot of this is contemporaneous with what later happens in the Black Death. In these difficult times, the global climate cools by maybe 15 Fahrenheit degrees, which doesn't seem like much, but we're talking global averages. The warmer the climate tends to be throughout human history, the greater our agricultural output, the greater our agricultural output as a species, the more human beings live to have children, the greater the population which up until the present Malthusian crisis is not a bad thing. When the global climate cools, agriculture becomes more difficult, and so it does in Europe. We have what begins uh, what is called the Little Ice Age, and this Little Ice Age causes the Mongols to leave Mongolia. It's not just Genghis's concept of uniting the eight corners of the world under one roof, it's the fact that the Mongols are like a hornet's nest that have been hit by a broom. Bzzz, and they leave and they conquer China and other things, other countries, up all the way into Central Europe, ultimately. In Europe, you have climate crises that include ridiculously protracted rains, which bring mottled fungi super mouth mushrooms growing everywhere, blighting the crops, turning the crops into barely or inedible garbage. Life becomes harder. In the late Middle Ages, starvation becomes a normal thing and werewolf legends abound. Werewolf legends. 
go back as, like vampire legends, they're almost ubiquitous. In any society that has any contact with wolves, there is this concept of vulpine human fusions. Well, here's where it comes from. In the late Middle Ages, when the crop yields fail, the peasants ate grass, they ate shoe leather, they stripped the land bare like a human locust swarm. Then they went into the hills, farther afield, looking for anything to eat. They found what they found, they stripped nature bare, destabilizing the ecosystem. Then they returned home to starve because they had nothing else, hoping that they could wait out this event until the next harvest season. The apex predators are the first affected when there is a disturbed food system. Oh, there's, a, there's a word for that. And I know it. I just can't recall it. Food chain, chain of consumption. Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Thank you. I, I just said that too. In any event, when a food chain or an ecosystem is disturbed, the apex predators feel it first. In European forests, the apex predator is often a wolf. Or, and wolves can never come alone. They're in packs. <clears throat> so the wolves would tend to leave the hills looking for food. And they smell weakness in the human villages. That's opportunity to get meat. Today, wolf attacks on humans are extraordinarily rare, especially in the Americas. But at a time when the countryside has been stripped bare of all edible material, the peasants in their huts, in their weakened state, make decent prey. So the wolves will go among the huts and the peasants will yell and make noise and the wolves will go away and then they'll come back and eventually the wolves will get bold enough to sniff in to the, <coughs> to the room where the people are laying, pushing aside the curtain. And people will yell and kick and Uncle Ed, who's closest to the door, will, you know, throw things. Eventually Uncle Ed will be gone, dragged out with two people too weak to help him. Uncle Ed is eaten by wolves, then Aunt Millie, then others. Times are so hard because of this climate change. And this blighting of the climate, which makes growing enough food much more difficult, is going to hang over the late Middle Ages, like a smoke pall, darkening the sun, limiting the brightness and joy that people are able to experience, simply because life is just much harder. Now, people still fall in love, they get married, children play, but the overall society is much more grim than it had been before. Huh. Oddly enough, the Little Ice Age persists until the middle of the 19th century, the middle of the 1800s which happens to be when about 50 years after the British started using coal in large amounts. It is entirely possible that human action in the form of coal burning ended the Little Ice Age and prevented the world from tipping into a new real Ice Age. In any event, <clears throat> this is going to affect the desperation with which people approach normal life. Next, the Hundred Years' War, which is actually well over a hundred years <clears throat> and includes various pieces. What's the Hundred Years' War about? Who will control France? Will France be ruled by the King of France? Or will it be ruled by the Duke of Burgundy from the areas between France and Germany? Or will it be ruled by the King of England, who controls much, much of northern and Western France. Who will rule France? And so these two nations, France and England, ultimately engage in this ongoing protracted struggle. In this struggle, <clears throat> things begin to change on the battlefield. First off, the French army is centered around the Armored Knight. And the Armored Knight in this time period, in the... Uh, 14th century and 15th century in the 13 and 1400s has a fully articulated metal shell. The horses are in full plate armor. 
the people are as well. Killing one of these knights from the ground is very, very difficult. So the French army is centered on the knight. The English army <clears throat> comes into France with a secret weapon, the Welsh longbowman. Wales is to the west of England and contains the Celtic Britons, who the Anglo-Saxons conquered in the early Middle Ages. In Wales, <clears throat> and the Welsh are the people that Tolkien based his elves on, the Welsh have a longbow that young men learn to shoot from a childhood age. This longbow has simply a longer piece of wood than the average bow. And if made properly, it has a much heavier pull. And with that much heavier pull, the arrow is going to hit with far greater force. Now, a shooting a bow is not like firing a rifle. Firing a rifle, unless you're doing it at very long range, is adjusting for windage, adjusting for range is a fairly minor thing at short and medium ranges. But unless you're shooting somebody 20 feet away from you, you've got to angle your bow up. You've got to estimate, do the math in your mind, how the trajectory is going to sail so that I can hit you and not the ground to the left or the right of you or behind you or in front of you. So I've not only got to aim at you, not, not that I would, please understand. It's the yellow mask. Um, so I've got to aim at you, but then I've got to take into account wind, okay? Wind's coming from this way. And what range are you? And are you moving? And all of that gets figured, and then I shoot, and either I hit or I miss. The Welsh were able to hit more often than not. Now, the Welsh didn't have body armor. They didn't ride around on horses. They were poor, not rich. But at the Battle of Creasy, the French army was slaughtered by Welsh longbow. Because the longbow arrow fired properly has enough force to penetrate any body armor. It's like a bullet hit it. Patoom! And suddenly you've got an arrow deep in your armor. So the longbow becomes a new weapon that the English employ to win battles. In 14... Oh, five or 1415. I always get that wrong. 1405, maybe 1450. King Henry V of England goes to France with a new army. And at the Battle of Agincourt, he faces a French army three times his size. Henry, before that battle, makes a famous speech that men abed in England today will curse their manhood for not being here with us on St. Crispin's Day. We, we few, we band of brothers, will stand together and face the French. And Henry, despite being well outnumbered by the French army, wins a decisive victory at the Battle of Agincourt. The longbowmen help fight the French knights, but Henry's tactics win out. So now Henry has defeated the main French army. And in doing so, Henry compels the king of France to marry the princess royale of France to Henry himself, who's still a young man. When Henry V marries the princess royale of France, the, 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 their children will rule a unified Franco-English or Anglo-French kingdom. Henry will rule a unified Anglo-French kingdom. And had that happened, the history of the world would be utterly different. However, Henry dies young, soon after the marriage of natural causes, we're pretty sure. Only you never know. Mushrooms, France. I love mushrooms. Some of them are very poisonous. Henry seems to die of natural causes, and the war resumes. But this time, even though the English have been on the winning side for decades, a 14-year-old peasant girl arrives in history, claiming that the Virgin Mary herself spoke to her. Her name was Joan, 
and she was made into a hero. A special set of female armor was made for her. And this Joan, just drop your pass off on my desk, please. This Joan was placed at the head of an army to relieve the English siege of Orléans. Joan's inspirational message that God himself wants the French to win causes the French army for the first time to win decisive victories against the English. Now she is eventually captured by the English, tried as a witch. Her, her voices are uh, deemed by the English court not to be the voice of God, but the voice of demonic powers. And she is burned at the stake. To the French, she is St. Joan of Arc, who is... Uh, Saint of uh, France, the way Saint Michael is to Germany, the way uh, Saint George is to England, sort of the patriotic saint of France. She and her example turns the tides and the French win the Hundred Years' War. This is why that's important. Had England unified with France, England would have remained a power with one foot on the European continent. It would not have conquered Scotland. It would not have conquered Ireland. It would not have put so much energy into building an overseas empire in North America and later in India. It would not have been on the course to build the largest empire in human history upon which the sun never sat, and that is the British Empire about 100 years ago. England would have been much more like Holland, a continental power with maritime interests, rather than being the island nation and the mistress of the seas that she became. So the French victory in the Hundred Years' War is quite important to our history. Now, victory has a thousand mothers. I'm sorry. I can't believe it. I'm really foggy, foggy today in my mind. Um... Ah, yes. Victory has a thousand mothers. Defeat is an orphan. No one wants to take responsibility for a defeat. Everyone wants to take responsibility for a victory. In the aftermath of the end of the Hundred Years' War, England descends into civil war between the House of Lancaster and the House of York. Lancaster, I believe, has a white rose as their symbol. York has a red rose as their symbol. This is the Wars of the Roses. Wars because there are several. This is the time of King Richard III, who Shakespeare wrote a play about. Richard was a villain, club-footed with a bit of a hump and a vicious... Oh gosh, what a vicious king. He kills his nephews like Roman Emperor Caligula did. And the climax of the play, Richard III, by Shakespeare, is Richard in the midst of the battlefield um, shouting, My horse, my horse, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Ultimately, he is killed. And the house of Lancaster falls. But the House of York is also prostrate. So a new house, the House of Henry Tudor, takes over England. And Henry Tudor, Henry VII, has a red and white rose as his symbol, symbol of the unification of England after the Wars of the Roses. And Henry Tudor's son is Henry VIII. And you will learn how Henry VIII and his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, are crucial figures in the period of early modern Europe. In the case of the Grand Duchy of Muscovy, which later became Russia, for a couple of hundred years, Muscovy is under uh, Mongol rule. And I told you that that tends to coarsen the Russian culture, making it much more willing to and appreciative of the application of raw, brutal force. Now, while 
Muscovy and its neighbor city of Novgorod were under Mongol rule. The army of the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights approaches Novgorod to try to expand the Baltic Kingdom of the Teutonic Knights deeper into northern Russia. Would you please close the shades and shut the lights in a moment. In this battle between the forces of Novgorod wearing Mongol gear and the forces of the Teutonic Knights, well, let's just say it's a turning point battle in that part of the world's history. The Battle of Frozen Lake Pskov. Question? Um, I was going to say, uh, forgive me if you already said, but how did um, King Richard die? Uh, he died on the battlefield okay. after, I know the battle's name, it's, a, it's got an interesting name, but I'm having difficulty recalling it. So he died on the battlefield in the last battle of the Wars of the Roses. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, this turning point battle is caught on film. Well, that's an interesting way of putting it. This battle is depicted on film in a classic movie of the Stalinist communist era in Russia. The movie is entitled Alexander Nevsky. And Alexander Nevsky is the name of the leader of Novgorod's forces who fight the Teutonic Knights. The movie was commissioned by Stalin around the time of the Munich crisis in 1938, when it looked like Russia and Nazi Germany were going to go to war. This is a great movie of Russian patriotism. And the Russians are depicted as wholesome, healthy peasant folk, and the Teutonic Knights are depicted in absolutely satanic fashion. Sergei Prokofiev, one of the greatest composers of the Soviet era in Russia, does the score. And the way that this film is shot, it's often called the world's first music video. It is a tone poem of battle. Evil Germans versus virtuous Russians. And I will show it to you now, both.